Welcome everybody to the final Design at Large talk for this quarter. Before we start today, I wanted to let all of you know that Jim Holland is running Design at Large this winter, and he already has a full slate of awesome speakers focused on visualization and interaction. Uh, we're going to kick off winter quarter with Pat Hanrahan, talking about a lot of his visualization research. So it's going to be really cool. And today, we have an awesome speaker. I think it may be the first time that we have had a PhD student as the Design of Art Seminar speaker, which is uh, cool for me. Uh, Stephanie is a PhD student at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Germany, uh, where she's working with Patrick Bardish, who many of you know. And uh, talk right at this? who has, has talked in, in this very room years ago. <laughs> And Stephanie's work is focused on personal fabrication and user interfaces for 3D printing and related fabrication technologies. And I think this is extremely interesting because um, if you've ever used a 3D printer, you know that the interfaces make no sense at all. And what you're going to see today is not just a small improvement over that, but a completely transformative improvement. For her work, she's won Best Paper Awards at the top HCI conferences. Uh, and again, rarely for a PhD student, she's been invited to be on the program committee for Kai and WIST. And so I heard she was coming to California to give us <coughs> to be on the Kai program committee, which starts tomorrow. And uh, we twisted her arm into coming down here for a day to join us for this seminar talk. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for the nice introduction. So as Scott already said, my work is in personal fabrication. And in this talk, I'm going to show you six of my research projects that I did for my PhD. But if you're interested, there are more projects on my web page. But before I really want to go and dive into the details, I first want to tell you why personal fabrication is actually such an important research area right now and why I'm working in this area. So many of you have probably noticed 3D printing is really on a hype right now. So it's on the verge of becoming a mass market. So in 2008, less than 400 consumer 3D printers were sold. But the numbers already went up to more than 35,000 in 2012. And market researchers predict up to 1 million sold 3D printers by 2017. So 3D printing, surprisingly, is actually not a new technology, right? It's already a 30-year-old technology. So the thing is that many of the core 3D printing technologies were patented in the 80s and 90s. So for instance, this technology here looks probably very familiar to some of you who use the Makeover today. This is a patent on how to roll plastic from a spool to extrude it through a hot nozzle and then put the plastic on a build plate to build up a 3D object. So it's 1992. So all of these patents that were filed in the 80s and 90s, they were owned by big companies who only served the small scale industry market, so the market for professionals. However, this really changed when in 2009, the first patent on this FTM plastic 3D printing expired. So 2009 was actually the year where many low-cost 3D printers now entered the market. So January 2009, this patent expired. February, Megabot started to sell their first 3D printers. But this is really only the start. So if you look at the uh, overviews of pets, you can see a lot of technologies are expiring these days or are about to expire in the next years. Also on completely new 3D printing technologies, different materials. So I believe that these are some strong indicators why this development could actually become true. However, I think going from there, there are two potential futures that could happen. And one looks like this here. <laughs> so why could this be? So the technology is definitely there. So for instance, you can get a cheap 3D printer for less than $400. But consumers are really lacking the design tools to create objects for their needs. The reason for this is that in the last 30 years, all the design tools were, of course, targeted at professional users who had years of professional training. <coughs> so I believe that if we can solve the challenges around design tools, we will see a different future, which looks more like this. 
with maybe everybody owning a 3D printer in the future and creating custom objects. So my research question um, for the research I'm doing is, how can we actually transition from these expert tools to tools for novice people? And for this, I'm drawing an analogy to the history of computing. And I'm going to walk you through this quickly in the next five minutes. So if you think about it, 3D printers are currently operated very similar to the batch processing uh, style of the punch cards in the early days of computing. So you create your 3D model. In the evening, you start your print job. And then the next day, you can come back and you can see your result. If you know this was not what you expected, you have to do the entire cycle again, have to wait another day. So batch processing is really limited to expert users because they have to think a lot ahead, right? They need to know what they are doing to not make uh, too many mistakes. Try and error really doesn't work here. So in the history of computing, when we moved away from this batch processing style and uh, we enabled completely new interaction paradigms, this now actually allowed a lot of people to use computers and to do very complex tasks such as document editing, which was an expert knowledge task in the 50s and 60s, and also editing video, for instance. So I believe we should repeat this evolution for physical matter. So what did it take us to get there, to this kind of easy to use interface? So what was two things. First, we needed faster turnaround times. So batch processing, you know, very slow feedback. When we move towards command line, you could get feedback basically every couple of seconds, which allows for this try and error process that many users, novice users do. Then the second step was actually a change in metaphor. So moving from this command line input more towards a direct manipulation, where you really have a clear idea of the object you're currently manipulating or the data. So my goal is really to repeat this evolution that we have seen for types of data, but now for the editing of physical matter. So I asked the question, how would a direct manipulation system for physical matter look like? And I believe it would look something like this. So instead of creating the physical object in a digital editor, we would actually create the physical object in the physical space, hands on on the material. So it's basically like crafting, but you get uh, computer support while you're creating your physical object. So towards this vision, I built a system called Constructable, and I'm going to show you uh, how this works now. So the idea is you have no digital editor, but instead you work directly on the laser cutter on the workpiece. So we use laser pointers to draw on the workpiece. So here we use a one laser pointer to draw the outline of this booklet. And then the laser cutter immediately comes and cuts it out for you. You can see we have different tools. So for instance, here, this is a round corner tool. You simply cross off the edges, and then the laser cutter comes and takes these edges out for you. And now I draw a flexible bend in the middle. And again, here the user doesn't need to know anything. You just draw this line, and the tool implements this flexible bend for folding the booklet. So the cool thing here is you don't have to wait until the very end to get something physical out. You get your physical output after every editing step. You can take it out, test it, put it back into the laser cutter, make the next step. And as you can see in this example, right, all the lines are aligned. Um, there's no random drawing here. We, we make it fit um, the existing drawing. So as I said, the benefit really is you can evaluate your design really early on. And you can build your subsequent steps in the design process based on what you already got in the previous design process uh, step. So we achieve um, precision by using different laser pointer tools. So it's uh, similar to the tools you have in like a Photoshop or some 3D modeling editor. And then we use simple laser pointers. So one laser pointer is just $6 or so. Beam on turns the beam on. And then the slide forward button is programmed to be the cut button. And then the slide backward button we program to be something that we call a sketch line. 
So a sketch line is instead of cutting through the material, we only engrave a small dash line. And then this dashed line can serve you as an alignment aid or a trial and error help. So if you're not yet sure, you can basically just make a sketch line. And when you're sure, you say, OK, now I want this cut through. So here I'm making a box and I'm extruding the four side walls for the space plate. So my favorite functionality is actually copying of existing objects. So instead of measuring or 3D scanning the object, you simply put it at the position in the laser cutter and you say trace with the trace tool. And then our overhead camera captures the outline and cuts this exactly for you into the uh, correct position. So of course, there's an entire implementation pipeline behind the system. I just give you one very easy example here. So what we do is we track the laser pointer path using an overhead camera. Then we run a sketch recognizer to fit the lines. And then we do additional alignment based on what you have drawn previously. So as I said, so direct manipulation is really great because you can work hands on on the workpiece. You get immediate feedback um, after every interaction you do. But as you can imagine, this also really requires faster fabrication because you don't want to wait overnight. You want to get physical feedback after every step. So one question for us was also, how can we make faster turnaround times for fabrication? So I brought this funny German advertisement here. So it shows a 3D printer and it says, everyone's asleep, only one is working. And I think this nicely illustrates you know, the time 3D printers take to actually fabricate something. So a small object this size can easily take 12 hours, 14 hours. So 3D printers are really, really too slow for this. This was also the reason why the constructivist system I showed you was based on a laser cutter, because they are really fast. But then again, laser cutters can only cut 2D, as you saw. So we asked ourselves, is there like a way how we can use laser cutters to make 3D objects? So cutting with the laser cutter works by focusing the laser on the workpiece. And then the material gets hot and evaporates, and you get this clean cut. So we said, like, hey, how about we move the workpiece a bit away from the laser so that the laser is defocused? And now what is really cool is that this area is wider. It just gets warm. And then you can actually use this area to bend the workpiece. So you can get like origami style objects. So here you can see the laser is focused and cutting. And now we defocus the laser. And you can see the strip is now much wider and the material just becomes warm and then under gravity the material falls. So this here is one of our example objects. It's a finger tracker for usability studies on a phone. So as you saw, we accomplished this object using five bands. And the cool thing is that you know if you do the same object with different approaches, 3D printing, the small object, four hours. Normal laser cutting, you get all these little finger joints you have to plug together. But then with laser origami, you get the object in three minutes, and it's completely self-assembled. So the really cool thing about the laser origami approach is that it's also fast enough to be integrated into the constructible drawing system. So here you can see this. This is my student Basti. And he just takes a laser pointer and says, OK, bend this here. And you can see how the system automatically now defocuses the laser again and accomplishes this bend for him. So the user really doesn't need to know anything except how to draw this one line there. Of course, as you can imagine, only origami-style geometry. But the cool thing is that we can really go 
much more beyond the simple fold of a 90 degree angle. So if you take an origami book and you look at the different techniques, there are many things we can also do. For instance, this uh, suspended inner plane here. So what we do is we cut these little arms in the corners. And then they basically function like a normal arm. When you warm them up, they unfold and suspend the inner piece. And now we move back into focus and cut it off. And then, you know, you can see in the video that this was one day before the deadline because we use a cable to hold the plant. All right, so the laser origami was one technique how you can make 3D objects with a laser cutter, but there are many other ways how you can do it. I will just show you one more that we did. And here we said, okay, bending is great, but how about like automatically stacking layers and welding different parts together? So as I said, for cutting, you normally focus on top of the workpiece and you only cut one layer. But we said, hey, how about we stack multiple layers in the laser cutter? And then the great thing is if you cut a little bit into the second layer, the material will get liquid at this position and then the two things fuse together. So you can see our master student Ludwig, and he takes three acrylic sheets, puts them in the laser cutter. And then we can make this scissor here in one go. So normally you would have to take out each separate layer, glue them together manually. But we can do this all in one automated process. And again, we also deliver the design software for the user, so you can just simply say like, okay, connect these two layers with each other. So as you can imagine here, if we come always from the top and we cut into the layers, you can imagine that you know, if you want to cut into deeper layers, you always have to hurt the top layer. So one question we also ask, how can we, for instance, you know, cut into here, but then close this layer again? So from the technical side, this is very interesting. We just cut off here a little piece. And then we again use the defocus laser that you know from the laser origami. And we can melt this part, which then fuses the top layer uh, back together. So we thought, OK, this is probably just a weak connection. But we found out you know, it's very interesting. So this is a small square cut from a larger square and then healed again. And we thought, okay, maybe it can take one kilogram or so. But you can see it can take up to eight kilogram. So what is really cool about this is, you probably ask yourself, okay, if I do something wrong in the constructible system, how am I going to undo this, right? It's a physical cut, how can I reverse this? So I think this would be, for instance, one really cool way to undo what you have done before. And you know, if you want to make this work on your laser cutter, we have a formula and we can just explain to you how to make it. So I showed you the, the two laser cutting techniques, but as you can imagine, they really are you know, a good way to extend the laser cutter expressivity, but they are not really like 3D printers. So in the last part of my research, I asked myself, you know, is there not a way how we can speed up 3D printing itself? And for this again, I looked at the history of computing. It's very interesting because when processing was slow, what we basically did is we rendered the uh, media in lower resolution to give real-time feedback even though, you know, the processing was slow. So I said, okay, let's do the same for fabrication. So instead of doing a full 3D print, we do a low fidelity rendering of the physical object. So the interesting part here is that we can save up to 90% printing time. So instead of getting an object in like four hours or so, you can get it within a couple of minutes. So the way we can save so much time is this new 3D printing technique where we also move the printer into Z direction. 
So if you know 3D printing, you know it's normally done layer-wise, so it's one layer, then the next one, and so on. And this is really not much faster than if you print like the solid object. So 14 minutes and the shape is preserved here. And you know, if you want to iterate, you can adjust and you can get a new version after just a couple of minutes. Of course, you do a full 3D print at the end when you're done with your iterations. So again, the user doesn't need to know anything here, right? You just load your 3D model, you use our software, click convert to a wireframe preview, and then our software encodes all the instructions for your 3D printer in G-code. So as I said, the wire print is really so fast because of its vector printing style. So we did a test at the beginning where we said, okay, let's take a wireframe, it's low fidelity rendering, but let's print it just normal way, like layer wise. But it turns out you only get like a two times speed up if you do this. So if we take our vector printing style, that is we really go up with the print head, only then you get like 90% or even more saving time for printing. So, as you can probably imagine, there are a lot of challenges with this. So our very first print on the side. Um, you know, when the material comes out of the 3D printer nozzle, it's warm, it's liquid. And only when it cools down, it solidifies. So if you go too quickly or you extrude too much material before you know the bottom material is solidified, you get a big mess on the side. So we ran a lot of experiments where we calibrated the correct parameters for our 3D printer. So here's one example, what I said. So for instance, if you go up and you go down and you do this too quickly, material is still warm, you get this curvy shape and you will not hit the correct corner in the next uh, run. So one thing we did is we added these blowers on the side which cool, uh, blow additional cool air onto the 3D print so you can actually go faster than with the normal uh, printing without the blowers. And uh, as you can also imagine, so this, for instance, does not work, right? If you try to go up and down, you would collide with the print head with the already printed material. So also in terms of meshing, we have certain constraints uh, that we have to solve. So here, if you print a parallel vertical line, this would, for instance, not work. So we came up with different meshing versions for our objects. You can see two of them here. So the first one always takes this up, down, up, down movement, and we make sure that all these vertical lines are aligned with each other. And when they are aligned, the object actually gets extra sturdiness. Versus on the right side here, you can see we left out the vertical lines. We just go here and then directly there. So it's even faster, but then it's less sturdy. So it's always a trade-off, you know, what does the user really want? And similar to you know, the digital rendering, we can also have different levels of detail rendering. So you can, for instance, have like a high fidelity version here and then low fidelity for the rest. And if you have any in-between questions, I'm also happy to answer them. So what I'm really proud about is that this wire print technique is now integrated into the Ultimaker 3D printer, which is the most popular 3D printer in the consumer segment. So some open source people took the paper, re-implemented it, and integrated it into the Ultimaker printer. So I showed you the wire printing technique, but as you can imagine, this low fidelity fabrication concept really goes beyond this one technique. So this here is really good for testing shape, for instance, but if you want to test a mechanical object, this is going to break, right? So I also developed different low fidelity fabrication techniques for different classes of objects. So for instance, this here is a technique for objects that require a certain sturdiness. 
So what we do is we take a 3D model, for instance, this head-mounted display here, and we build a software where users can quickly convert it into different representations for laser cutting. So I'm not sure if you can see this on the side, but there's a slider which says fidelity towards speed. And the more you drag towards speed, the more 2D parts are replaced in your 3D model for laser cutting. And again, the user can say, OK, I want to have this with finger joints. I want to have this with living hinges. So it's all dependent on what the user wants for his prototype. And also, you know, the user doesn't need to know anything. We export the files. You just send them to your fabrication device, and that's it. And we also did a version for a modular assembly, such as LEGO, because it's still one of the most uh, well-known prototyping toolkits. So what we do here is you can load a 3D model, and in our software, you can convert it to LEGO, which was fun to code, so definitely recommend it. <laughs> And then you can take a brush and say, but I want this high resolution. And then the great thing is that the software exports the parts with the knobs to actually be clicked into your prototype. So you don't have to kind of glue them in or something like this. So of course, this is not a final version, but just for prototyping, right? You can have a version within one hour. You can test, is the lens distance to the display correct? Do I need to adjust something? And again, open source, so give it a try. So the cool thing about the low fidelity fabrication is it's something that is very close to enable this direct manipulation principle. So what we currently do is we bought a robotic arm that is also able to, for instance, print on the object from the sides. So now I can really go into the 3D space, say I want something here, please add something here, and the robot arm can come and, for instance, use the wire printing approach to add uh, material on the side within a couple of minutes. So we are also still exploring with different low fidelity fabrication techniques. So this is something we just tried last week in our lab. So think of this as laser origami 3D. So we have a, a plastic sheet, and then we are going to use a heat gun to heat up certain parts of that sheet. And we have a compressor which pushes uh, air pressure in it. So you can create like a 3D object really quickly. So here we are still experimenting with the pressure and the heat just to do like a first early prototype. So you think this might, maybe, might even be like the better technique one step further from the wire print to kind of create a three-dimensional object quickly. And what is really great is that with the air pressure, you can have positive or negative air pressure. So you can also suck stuff back in, push stuff out, so this is something where we really think we could go with like an interactive 3D system. Yeah, here's an early sketch of this. Robo arm, material there, compressor under the table. And then some finger tracking where the user can say, hey, I want to push this out, push this in. So, I mean, I already showed you like we need two steps. One is definitely the faster turnaround times. And I made a step in my dissertation research to go closer to this. But of course, the long-term goal would be to have like instant fabrication. That, yeah? So there is a basic question on the faster turnaround time, which is also the time actually required to make something else. Has the idea of having multiple heads, multiple printing heads, that been considered? And if it's not a possibility, then is it because it becomes too expensive, or is the software matching that will be too costly? It's a very good idea. So we all also discussed this, having like multiple extruder heads, not like one thickness, but have like one very big extruder doing the base, then a small extruder doing the other parts. I think this is also one option, but I think it's still too slow. And you also have these physical constraints that come into, so you might collide with what was already printed. And I think for the early stages of prototyping, you probably also don't need it. But I think like for the full resolution printing at the end, I would definitely, so if you have time for this, go ahead and do it. So in the second step, as I said, is like this change in metaphor towards more direct manipulation. And of course, you know, there's a long way to go in this direction. As I said, like for this, we really need instant fabrication. So physical matter has to change in real time. 
And you can probably think about there are also other people approaching this from different angles, so like modular robotics, pro programmable matter, fabrication people. And I always really like to bring this up here as a, a visu visualization of what I mean with instant fabrication, a Star Trek holodeck. I think this really nicely captures what I believe we might have in the future. So instead of only using virtual reality where you only see things, display them, but you can't really use them, you can actually really use the objects immediately after you imagine them or downloaded them. So personal fabrication is a really big topic. And my dissertation was mainly looking at speed and how we can have this direct manipulation and interactivity. But as you can imagine, there's also, for instance, material challenges. There are questions around domain knowledge. So how can we abstract what the user has to know in able to, uh, to be able to create something? And then also really long-term challenges such as sustainability. Right? So once everybody can create anything, anytime, instantly, from real material, which creates potentially real waste, how are we going to handle this? And of course, intellectual property also a big problem. I mean, we have seen this in the past with different types of media. You know, video, music industry, they all had big problems. The next step is really physical objects. So in the remaining 10, 15 minutes of this talk, I just want to speak quickly about one project I did in the area of sustainability. So as I said, unlike digital things that we display on a monitor, physical objects you know, require material and they create waste. So I, I want to show you one example of how wasteful we are currently in our prototyping process. So let's say I'm producing this uh, phone holder here and I forgot to leave some space for the home button. So in the current fabrication process, you have to trash the object and reprint it entirely. So let's say you forgot another thing again, trash and reprint. Your object broke, you have to trash it and reprint it. Your print job fails, everybody who has 3D printed before knows that happens quite often. Trash and reprint. You get a new phone after a year, just a tiny bit larger, you have to trash and you have to reprint it. And I think, you know, in that term, we are very wasteful right now. So I asked myself the question, is there like a way how we can extend the life cycle of a 3D printed object? So we said, okay, how about we, instead of printing from scratch, we print the change directly on the existing object. So for this, we added a bit of hardware to a maker board. So there's a normal print head, but then we also added a mill for taking off material. We added this five axis rotating platform so we can also come from the side. And we also added a 3D scanner to know where the object is after we put it back in. So same workflow. But this time I put my phone holder back in the 3D printer. Then our software 3D scans it. And then the user simply has to load the old model and the new model into our software. So you see the old version. And when you direct the new version onto our software, we actually analyze which part has changed between the two versions. And then you simply say, patch my existing object. And our system mills off the part that is outdated and prints a new part directly on it. So you can see in this case it saved 96% of material compared to printing from scratch. So when we want to add this feature here, our software also analyzes, for instance, in this case, it's better to rotate the object to minimize waste and material. And then also when your phone breaks, what we currently do is we just ask the user to mark the part in the software that broke off. And then again, we just repair the part instead of printing from scratch. 
So similar to the wireprint I showed you, this is very challenging for technical reasons because in digital it's really easy. You just take two versions, you make a diff between them, and you know what's going to be added or removed. However, when you try then to add this part in the physical domain, your print head crashes into the existing object. And we need to take this into account when we calculate what to add and what to remove. So what we do is we know that this part should be added, and then we check um, with something that's called the Minkowski sum if the printhead is going to collide in any area along the surface. And then we can easily identify, okay, this part definitely needs to be removed. But if you farther along, you probably notice, oh, this is really not enough because removing this part there can again cause more collisions, right? So in the end, we have to re remove this part here. So this, of course, can be optimized by making the printhead in the mill, for instance, smaller. And as you can imagine, this algorithm gets more complex if you take the rotation also into account. So we can rotate in any angle and which is going to be the optimal one. So this patching approach is really just the first step towards more sustainable 3D printing. You can imagine there's way more things that need to be done. So for instance, what happens with the material that we milled away? Some of you might know there are these filament extruders. You put your a shredded plastic in the top and you get fresh 3D printing material out at the bottom. But there the problem is also that after two or three times your material degrades and gets brittle as with any recycling of plastic. And you know, this really gets much more challenging if you have multi-material prints. So imagine with a 3D printer, every single voxel pixel can have a different material. How are we going to separate them? How are we going to split them out? And then if you think back to what happened in computing, I think the biggest problem actually is the machines itself. So maybe there's going to be a more slow for 3D printers, you know, resolution gets better, speed gets better, material gets better. Will people again just throw out their devices, get a new one every n months. So I briefly talked about these different uh, fields or areas within fabrication that really need additional research to be solved. First, on a very basic level with hardware and software to allow people to create more objects for what they actually really need. But then on the top level also, you know, what happens if we achieve this step, right? What happens to society? We should really start thinking about this already right now. So, I'm really happy to see that, for instance, in HCI and graphics, a lot of people started to work on these areas. So if you just look like five years back, right, nobody was actively researching the user challenges or challenges from the graphics perspective on like physics-based uh, fabrication. So for instance, this year at CHI, we already had 15 papers on fabrication. So I think if we keep tackling these challenges, we will see this future that I showed at the beginning where everybody will own a 3D printer. So with this, I want to end my talk. I want to thank my advisor, Patrick Bordisch, and also I'm working with a lot of undergrad and grad students. And without them, you know, you can't do everything yourself. So I'm really thankful for them. And yeah, I left a lot of time for questions, so I'm really happy to hear more about your opinions. And if you have any questions, just talk to me. Thank you. And if you've investigated yet, combining that first system, the laser cutter system, with some sort of projection and sculpting that's auto-corrected in like 3D space. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. What I really try to push with my research is uh, to do everything physical. Mm -hmm to kind of take out all the digital projection in 3D space, to kind of really make stuff immediately kind of touchable and testable. And I think if you project on top of something, um, you're probably, is that answering your question? Well, a little bit, yeah. I mean, what you're trying to do is envision, especially the complex part, how it's going to work in a 3D space and how it's going to interact with other parts. But then- Oh, I see, you mean like so a 3D- So you're a sculptor and you're mm -hmm. trying to do a prototype by I hand, see. you have problems with tolerance mm -hmm. and other things. But if you have, oh, okay, the similar to the uh, robotic surgical systems do things like this, <coughs> right? Where the surgeon is not doing something precise, but it actually mm -hmm. will come in 
and knowing the model that it has encoded of the spatial organ, be able to correct for the human error mm -hmm. in real time. So I think like the first part that I understood is like this laser cutting is a 2D projection of a 3D thing you envision. And I think this is really a tough challenge for everybody who is new to laser cutting to do this projection from, I have this 3D object in mind, how do I decompose this into 2D parts? Mm -hmm. And I think it would be very interesting to maybe on the side have something that can visualize like how it's going to be in the end. Right. Or maybe draw some connection lines on the plates to show like, okay, these parts are going to be assembled this way. Yeah, going between the virtual mm -hmm. and the digital to iteratively mm -hmm. get where you need to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but on the long run, I think we will want to have like a real 3D system. So I think laser cutting is cool right now because mm -hmm. it's really fast and you can get output really quickly. Yeah. But I think in the end, what is more user friendly in terms of imagination is probably the 3D printing or like a formative right. 3D approach. Yeah, yeah exactly. So have the, the printer that can make the shape you want in 3D space in the miller that can get in and change the shape as you need. So you say like adding and subtracting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. I think it will make lives better. <laughs> I think currently, you know, people are always happy with their current state of the art, but in long run, just take like clothing or something, right? We are all happy with our clothing, you know, we go to the shops and we buy it. And, but how would the future be if you could have like personalized clothing perfectly for your body, right? So this is probably something that people would not kind of say, oh, I really, really want it. But once you have it, you understand that, you know, the past was really not that great. And I think this will apply to all of the other areas too. So if you can have something custom made for you, like handmade, like all the rich people can have today, who would not like that, right? Yeah, yeah, so I think the, the difference between like 2D and 3D printing is that there's very little need to do a 2D print because you can ha have everything on a display mm -hmm. in terms of information. It's more like an information output device, right? But 3D printing, if you make an object that you can use in a physical environment, there's really a need to 3D print there, right? Because you want the object. It's not enough to have it here on your screen. Yeah, so material is a really interesting area to work in. So if you're interested in like soft fabrication and clothing, this is something that Disney Research is doing a lot. So they have all these uh, industrial kind of knitting fabrication devices and they now hack them to make like personalized, customized designs. So what I mainly used for my, from my material perspective is more for the function of the object, but I haven't looked at, you know, what does the user prefer in terms of materiality. So I saw like one very interesting paper where also from a sustainability point, people were asked like, you know, what does it take for you to make like an object feel more personal or for more, feel more special for you? So you hang on to it and don't trash it immediately. And they found out that if you give people the choice to customize three things, they feel it was custom made for them. That's the current ratio. So I think these are like all, this could be like material, right? Like a bit softer, a bit harder, or you know, I prefer this over that color, shape. I think this is like a really interesting area also to explore from, you know, attachment theory perspective. So, so your work is um, uh, along the lines of creatively using the existing technology or, you know, some extensions of that to sort of allow this uh, improvement. Do you see a role for like, you know, um, sort of inventing new, uh, I don't know, laser technologies or, uh, you know, different, completely redefined, you know, redefining the, the printing technology itself? Yeah, I think, so I always come from the perspective, like, what do we have now and how can we change it to help the user? So as I said, like an expert, you know, they can plan ahead. They don't really need like a faster fabrication approach, I guess. 
Um, so, but if you could develop like completely new techniques that keep speeding up 3D printing, I think this would be really the way to go in the long term. So I think the low fidelity rendering is now great because we don't have this kind of technology that maybe chemists or material scientists are going to develop in the next years or decades. So it's really great now to explore all the different interaction techniques and metaphors that we will then use once we have this much faster 3D printing. So I think there's a, a lot of interesting stuff coming up. Also, I'm not sure if you heard of, of the carbon 3D and the clip technology. So this is also something that sped up 3D printing quite, quite a bit in the last years. But again, it's patented, so we will probably see it in like 20 years or something. Uh, this is an interesting talk, thank you. Uh, the question I had for you was, can you break something that we have printed in one printer, so no one can access that one, but repair it with another printer? What steps would you need to take in order to have the second system run the model of the previous one and get I guess you can use a depth camera with the encoding station and the print pattern itself, or there's some ideas you have there. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you don't have the 3D model, how do you repair it? I think it's a really interesting question. So from my personal opinion, I hope that we are going to have 3D models of everything in the future, because either you 3D model it at some point, right, and it's going to be in the cloud somewhere, or you bought it from some online store and print it at home, and they have the 3D model, and you might pay like $2 to get your object fixed instead of getting like paying $10 for getting a new one. If you don't have the 3D model, I think it would be very interesting from a graphics perspective if you could reason maybe about the complete shape based on what you have. I think this would be a very interesting problem. I'm not sure if there's a solution right now. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the, the answer to this is always like, what are the goals of the different user groups? And what would be like, why would a consumer novice person even want to use like a high end mechanical function SolidWorks tool? And I think this really, I mean, I always speak about consumers and novice users, but we all know it's not just two categories, right? There's like a, a big spectrum in between. And I think you cannot just kind of provide one solution for everybody, right? I think this is not going to work. So there's a lot of, also from the design research perspective, a lot of research needed to find out, you know, what do these different makers versus novice pe people versus, you know, kids who currently grow up, what is their approach to kind of making? I think these are all very interesting questions that need additional research, yeah. So I have a question, which is, your Lego work was so evocative for me because of the fact that you've got two different technologies that you're blending together. And here you've got two passive technologies that you're blending for mm -hmm. speed reasons. Um, I imagine you thought about blending two different materials for other purposes, that one's bendy and one's stiff, mm -hmm. or one's transparent and one's opaque, or one is chips that you put inside the smart glasses mm -hmm. and the other one is the, the housing. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious what thoughts you had about that. Yeah, so I think there are definitely a lot of interesting ways how you can do it. So one idea we also had is, hey, maybe we can also combine like what you have on a normal, uh, how do you call it, home store with like 3D printing personal parts. So for instance, why you model, you could say like, hey, you know, these are like standard parts I could reuse and here are my custom parts in between and it would output something like to buy versus custom things you fabricate. The other question is, you know, how can you blend like, for instance, two materials? And I did one project in that space where we had um, a moldable material that you could 3D print and a stiff material. So you could say, okay, here are some fixed parts where I'm really sure I want to have them this shape. But then you can hands on kind of reform the parts where you are not yet completely sure. So I think there's a lot of interesting space in saying, okay, this is fixed, this is you know customizable, flexible, um, adjustable. And I think there's a lot more stuff that can be done. Yeah. 
and also on the actuation side, you know, motors and just getting into kinematics, dynamic objects. I think that's really the way to go because currently it's like all shape objects, right? So it's all just, you know, a coffee cup or a booklet or something. But if you use, look at all the objects we use every day, there's a much wider range of objects we use. So yeah, it's uh, in Germany. So there's also one startup which especially for produced a 3D printer for schools. <laughs> so it's kind of like a makeup bot, but especially you know safe and whatnot. And so they try to bring the technology into schools. And it's also a big thing in the US. So um, for instance, in Stanford, they have a Fab Learn initiative that tries to bring like 3D printing to K-12 teachers. And for the Lego project, we also collaborated with them and uh, told them, you know, it's open source, you can go ahead, use it. We would love to hear your experiences in the classroom. Because if you think about what I said about prototyping is especially true in the classroom, because you have like 45 minutes, maybe you have like 90 minutes. You need quick feedback, otherwise your students get unhappy, right? So just going from the Lego part, which they already know, adding in a little bit of 3D printing, you can get like this technology fusion. I'm fine.